the FBI. For Christ's sake, just let me pay this Tom, back. please call the FBI. Well, I had the opportunity to direct Ransom. Uh, we went into production in, uh, in 1996. And uh, for me, it was, it was uh, quite a departure. I'd, I'd never worked on a, uh, quote, you know, crime drama before. Where is my son? Somebody nabbed your kid, and you think that it's me. You are accusing me! Get off him! I got six of my own kids, and I would die for every one of them! Dan Hanley and I have worked together on a, on a, a lot of movies. Virtually every movie that I've directed except one, the very first one, which is a Roger Corman movie called Grand Theft Auto, directed, uh, edited by Joe Dante. After that, it's, uh, it, it, I started working with, uh, with Dan, first under his mentor, Bob, Bob Kern, Kern. Yeah. Uh, and, then, and then later. And then later, Mike Hill joined the, the team, and Mike's not here. He'll, no, he'll, 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 he'll have something to say about this. He'll give us, yeah, he'll give us some grief when he sees this for not, for not being here. But, uh, we'll get him a copy of the DVD as a yeah. present. <laughs> Are we set? No! Get back! It really is a director's and an editor's medium, you know? And as an actor, your rhythm is not necessarily the rhythm of the film. Why don't you just back off, all right? You step up and I'll back off. <laughs> Come here. Listen to me. Look. With the candy bars and shit. It's just that you might be making beds in a burning house. So you have to sort of trust that the director has the sense of what that rhythm is. And I think that the funny thing about Ron is that sort of he's always sort of, he's kind of always wired on set. And, and I think it's because he's always got that rhythm going in his head. The question of sort of rhythm and tempo was, was a factor. And I think if there was any surprise for me in, in staging and presenting um, a suspense thriller, working in that genre, I think it was how crucial the timing really is. When we first got there, it was the first show we did on an Avid, and Ron wanted to see with the staging and with the camera work with Piotr to see how much movement he could do. So the first couple days, you had shot videotape right. on, a, on a sequence with varying camera moves, some more severe than others, to see how they would intercut. And then he sent all that, all that rehearsal back to us in the editing room. I wanted to try to make this as experiential as possible for the audience. So, and, and I tried to play a great portion of the movie from either Mel Gibson or Rene Russo's uh, points of view. Understand that this guy, I don't know where he's coming from, and I think he's a professional. Now, if he starts throwing his curveballs out there, we are going to have to improvise, and we might not be able to protect you, Mr. Mullen. When the FBI is swirling around them, Delroy Lindo and his group, it's actually all shot, uh, or 95% is shot from either Mel's point of view or Renee's point of view. And sometimes in the same scene, the point of view actually shifts. But a lot of it was going to be done with Steadicam. And I wanted to experiment with sort of how intense those moves could be. And if we could switch um, the, the perspective, how it would hold. Piotr Sobaczynski, the cinematographer on Ransom, who tragically passed away, was a brilliant uh, young cinematographer, and it's a real loss. Uh, had some wonderful ideas that we had talked about, and I also wanted to experiment with that. He shot some of that video. Right. And then we sent it off to you to cut. And then even on that on that one sequence, there was a sequence between uh, Mel and Gary on a phone conversation, and you had us cut Mel's side of the conversation with all the moves, okay. so that you could so he could kind of think about how he wanted to counter those moves when he shot Gary's side of it. I want to talk to my son. Come alone. Wait, hold on. I, uh, Sean has asthma. Uh, he's very serious. What is the weather like? Is it rainy, damp? Is he in a cellar on a mountaintop? Please don't. My son gets vertigo. 
How's the linguist doing with my accent? It's, just, it's pretty innovative. I've never worked on anything that's shot quite like that. It's, it's got a, a, a very definite style that's coming out of Ron's head. What I admire about Ron is his ability to keep an extremely relaxed set. Relaxed, but extremely efficient and, and, and functional. Things move, things get done. This was kind of intense material for, for all of us involved. And Mel wears as a badge of honor the, the sense that he, none, none of this gets to him. That uh, he can turn it on and he can turn it off. And so as a result, he's always joking around. What do you want from me? What? <laughs> and the more serious the scene, you know, the, the, the goofier he could get from time to time. I mean, one time we were getting ready to do this, you know, this painful, terrifying scene, and he pops around and he's got a clown nose on for the close-up uh, and, and does a take. And, uh, and so we got into, you know, a lot of joking around. He would, he would do a John Wayne voice, and I would, I, I would do uh, Jimmy Stewart. I'd be Jimmy directing the, the, the Duke. We, 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 saw, we, 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 we came to, well, we, were, we were paid to, to work. <laughs> so so that, that's what we did. We, we worked. Uh -huh. and, and, if, and if we had to laugh over well, then we'd, we'd, we'd pretend. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't actually be funny. <laughs> it was tough. It was the hardest, definitely the hardest thing I've ever done. Act better is what he's saying. Very well. He's saying act natural, be better, a little looser, Renee, you're stiff. That's what he wants to say. I translate him. You know, I give Ron the credit for pushing me and pushing me and pushing me to that place. But, you know, once you're at that place, then you have to do it from five different angles, five takes a time. And Mel, I would go in there trying to hold on to some kind of something, some, some kind of emotion. And Mel just said, you know, Renee, you just got to let it go. He's cracking jokes, meanwhile, in between the takes. The Gettysburg Address by Rene Russo. Thank, I'm take it. Say, I'm not, I'm not. You could just cut, like, on Mel. And I don't work that way, so I've got to, like, get away from him. Good conflict. Without conflict, you got nothing. And finally, he said, Rene, you got to let it go. You're going to kill yourself doing that. And I said, I, I, but Mel, that's the way you work. Hello. That's not the way I work, Mel. But I couldn't work that way, because, that, you know, it's like having a good cry. You have a good cry and it's over. Meanwhile, I have to do it 20 more times and it's over. And he said, just go on to the set with nothing, nothing. And I did. I went on with nothing until Ron said action and somehow I got there and I, can't, I cannot tell you how. I like the idea, yeah. You want the money? Come and get it. And when he comes and gets, I hope somebody cuts their heads off, you know? I get that voice from the Bronx, and we just totally Take care. mess him up big time. Thank God never been involved with anything like this, but as a parent, certainly uh, feared it and thought about it. The abduction of a child, you know, and the jeopardy of that child and what's going to happen to him and how the parents are dealing with it and coping with it on, a, on an hourly and minute by minute basis um, makes it very very dramatic and very emotional because people can identify with what if i was in that situation how would i react i, I had experienced something like that too this is we're talking now about the scene where mel and renee you know m miss their son they assume he's lost and and they start you know m moving around uh desperately trying to find him and uh, I, I, I lost my daughter Jocelyn in uh, Quebec City, and you know, on a busy touristy day, and it was just a, the worst ten minutes of my life until we found her again. Anybody who'd take a kid from their parents for money is pretty evil. This script sort of gets involved in the lives of these people who are committing this crime in a kind of personal way, which is interesting. I mean, it's an interesting perspective to take, because normally you wouldn't want to identify with someone who would do something as horrible as kidnap a, a nine-year-old child. But the fact remains that they're people. It's undeniable that they're human beings. Well, it is actually interesting, because what you see is, you know, a family shattered by their, the taking of their child. I hadn't thought of it before, but then uh, the kidnappers is their own family. 
and having taken on this child and, and this thing, this crime, uh, how it affects that family, not both families. Clark, you never said nothing to me about killing no kids. Do you understand what is going on now? You do not joke with this kid. You don't play with him. You don't talk to him. Don't talk to my oh, brother, He's not right? your pet. Look, look, this is real. You don't got to talk to my brother, all right? You got nothing to say to him. I have to say, I would just shoot my husband, get him out of the picture right away. If he said, no, we're not going to pay, I would go, really? Ah, oh, OK. You're dead. I'd be just like, just tell me what to do. I'd ask the experts, and I'd just do it. I am going to get the best group of manhunters in this country, and I am going to dedicate my life to tracking you down. Hey, hey, get your head out of your ass! The sequence that I, I feel is one of the most compelling in the movie, and, and you know, I'm proud of the filmmaking involved in, in bringing that sequence to the screen, is the sequence where it begins with a phone conversation between Mel Gibson's character and Gary Sinise's. Sinise is outraged. Who do you think you're dealing with? Give me the money! Don't you understand English, you useless piece of shit? No money, none! Let me tell you something. You think you're suffering right now? Huh? You got no idea what suffering is. If I don't get the cash in one hour, this kid is dead! Give me back my son! Hello! You want him? Yes! You want him? Daddy! Ah! Oh, Jesus! Jesus! Mel Gibson, Rene Russo, Delroy Lindo, they all feel that the kid may have been, child may have been shot. We don't know. The audience doesn't know at that point. And then, at, at that moment, Mel Gibson w wanders out onto the balcony, and, and you don't know is, whether he's going to jump over the edge or, you know, Rene Russo's character comes and comforts him, and intercut between that moment when this distraught, shattered couple comes together in support, even in this time of absolute, you know, horror. This is the moment when Gary Sinise turns on his own people and starts assassinating his own, his own family. What I always liked was when we're, when we're doing some of the uh, preview audience uh, screenings with the audience, mm -hmm. how they really hooked in on the kid getting shot, mm -hmm. that that worked, and they really thought that the little boy had possibly been shot. And then when Mel went right over the edge, you had that camera move that kind of went up and over, mm -hmm. and they thought, oh, my God, he's going to leap. Yeah. You could hear, you could, you could feel the audience just, you know, you could feel him tense up. From a thematic point of view, this is the story of a functional family and a dysfunctional family. The timing, the rhythm, the power of the idea, the sort of the central thematic idea there and the acting, um, uh, the, the music, it's the photography, it all, it all comes together for me in that sequence, and I'm very proud of it. Doofus, when I got a big movie to direct, and what am I doing playing with uh, flipper sticks? <laughs> I'm so happy today because I don't have to wear pantyhose. We're starting off. We're starting off as your point of view, and then we're going to do the no old swing this. around or cut back to you or something. Right. No pantyhose. Delightful. We're cheating. <laughs> uh, I had a whole show going on back here. <laughs> Never too soon to get the publicity machine in motion. I look like I actually have a point of view about something there. I probably was saying, and when do we eat? Bring up the music. <laughs> Mel, what should I do? <laughs> it's like opera. It's yeah. operatic. <laughs> yeah. Operatic direction. Really? <laughs> Please hit your mark. And action. Uh, 
You have to say, Ron, why am I saying this all day? Why am I saying this all day? Oh! If you're in the script, I'll take a look. <laughs> Rubber band. <laughs> Malu. It's anamorphic. Hey, look, anamorphic. Right? 185. <laughs> 16. All right. Okay, stand by, please. Super 70. Yeah, I'm glad I don't know these things. I'd be so paranoid. And now I'm in a closet. Uh, but a very interesting and, 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 uh, and appropriate one. Thank you. Uh, that's a good location. Good location, good scene. Whenever I'm directed to kidnappers, I have a one rule, don't shave. Um, otherwise, I'm not going to shave. Love scenes, always shave. I can't push in too much, 27. Should we do this with 35? You'll get some sun, you guys. You're getting sun. I would say, the apartment is No, but it's just for school. I really don't want to come back tomorrow. That's it. The sun's about to come out. They're not listening to me. They're panicking. I'm glad I'm not the director.